Hello everyone, this is Annie from the University of Chicago Alumni Career Services. Thank you so much for joining us today for part three of three of planning and executing the mid-career job search with Marilyn Motes Kennedy. We're still thrilled to have her. Um, she's given us a lot of great things to think about in the first two sessions. Um, if you somehow missed the email that came out with the link to download the first two sessions, please just go ahead and email me, Annie White at uchicago.edu. Um, as we go through the presentation today, please feel free to go ahead and uh, send your questions in to me. I'll, I'll be holding on to them and then jumping in occasionally to, to ask Marilyn if she can share and expand on some of the questions. To send a question, just use the chat box, which is in the dashboard to the right of your screen at the bottom, and go ahead and type your question and then use the drop-down box to send the question to staff. And that will send it to me, and I'll go ahead and hold on to those until there's a good time to jump in. So feel free to do that at any point during the presentation today. And without further ado, let's go ahead and just jump into the material. I'll pass it over to Marilyn. Good afternoon. We're here for part three, and we're going to deal with the problems job hunters are worried about. We're on the page called The Sequel, and I want to talk about making your age work for you. As far as I know, there is no way that you can become younger. Therefore, wouldn't it make sense to use your age as an advantage, make it work for you, instead of trying to deny it? I have had several clients who've had what are called lifestyle lifts, that is facelifts, and they claim that it was tremendous and helped them get a job. I would say to you that what they actually got was a lot more confidence because they thought they looked better. I say do whatever it takes, but if you don't want to or can't make yourself look younger, there are a couple of things you can do. You can start positioning age as an advantage. You can start talking about what you've accomplished and the things that you can bring to the party that no one younger than you can bring. You can talk about why age is an advantage in this job. You can also switch the interviewer from thinking of his age or your age as a disadvantage to thinking of it as an advantage. I owe this to a client 30 years ago, but it's never been better. She was going into an interview with someone half her age who was visibly bored. He obviously had already written her off. What could she bring to the company that was wonderful? So as they're walking through the waiting area, she turned to the interviewer and she said, you know, you have so many young people here. What kind of role models and what kind of mentoring do you provide? Everything was different. The interviewer had to listen to her with respect because that was one of the issues in having so many younger people. You've got to come up with five reasons that your maturity will be valuable to the organization and write them down. You're not under the stress of an interview going to remember. You do know, don't you, that in an interview you can have evidence, you can have charts, you can leave behind, you can have any kind of material that will benefit your case. As you work to make your age important to the person trying to hire you or who potentially can hire you. Another tactic is to argue the contrarian position. You can say, it might seem as if 10 years experience is too much, but consider this and then show how the technology has changed, whatever is relevant. But you have to do this before. You cannot come into an interview and hope that spontaneity will rescue you. I have never had much faith in spontaneity. It will get you into trouble, but it will never give you arguments on the spot. When we talk about being a contrarian, what we're talking about is any question to which you can say, well, you could look at it that way. However, so if someone says, well, you probably aren't going to work more than another five years, your response can be, I have no intention of retiring at all. I want to work. This is the most important thing in my career right now. 
I would be good at volunteer work. Third, you have to have many, many, many. You heard that, three many. Examples of past successes. How I saved the day, how I got other people to save the day, which is a million times more important than you're having flown in there in your cape and saved whatever the project was. You need to write these out. And this is something you could use as a leave behind. I really like this because it gets stable to your resume. Ten ways I made a difference in my last job. Twelve things that I initiated that the organization I worked for is still using. You notice that none of this is confidential. None of it is going to be something that would embarrass anybody. How would these be phrased? They would start out by saying, three weeks into the project, it was clear that we didn't have enough research. In two days, I got more information, filtered through the information. In other words, they're scenarios. And the reason these are powerful is everybody else is telling me stuff that isn't in writing that I can't take notes on. I mean, I can't take notes during the entire interview. And they leave me looking like everybody else. Oh, yes, I was a great manager. My employees loved me. How about a page? of comments from your subordinates saying how you made a difference in how they did the job. That's the kind of stuff that sets you apart and makes age an advantage. It isn't that people in their 50s are more expensive than people in their 30s. If you're doing the same job that someone 20 years younger is doing, you all should be paid the same. I mean, that's the whole idea. The idea of seniority now in a non-union environment is completely strange. So you have to show that your value is greater. They're getting something they aren't paying for. It's always fair to say, could a 20-something do that? Could a new hire know as much about how to make clients or customers happy as I do? You might as well tote it right out there. I always tell people, hang on to your flag, march it out there, and plant it on the interviewer's toe. The interviewer has interviewed 10 people who tried to portray themselves as wonderful with building leaping qualities. But they also didn't try to be memorable. They said things like, I can do it better. I have no idea what that means. Better than what? better than my expectations, better than the last person in the job, which you really couldn't know what the last person in the job did. So what we're trying to do is to make specific details sell your skills and experience to the potential employer. What I have found is reserve your biggest stories for the initial interview. Then you can repeat them to the next interviewer, but you've got to get through the initial screening. People tend to be perfunctory about this. They're in the interview, and instead of saying, let me give you an example of something I did three weeks ago, which immediately rivets my attention because we're not talking about ought to. Instead of get, being very specific and jumping in there and being visibly, although you're probably on a telephone, being vocally energetic, you're relaxed and you're thinking, how much longer does this go on and when do I get to the real event? This is the main event. I want you to stand up. I want you to hold your notes in your hand. I want you to speak into that telephone as if it were a microphone, as if you were face-to-face -face with the potential hire. You've got to get through the screening. Don't treat that in a perfunctory way. If you had to prepare right now and you knew you were going to have an interview tomorrow and you believed that they probably weren't so enthused about you but you have great stuff on your resume so they're going to at least do an initial interview, I would say to you, sit down, go through your resume as if you were seeing it for the first time and say, what else can I tell somebody about what I've done? How else can I position my accomplishments 
so that they will be immediately obvious because the person on the other end may or may not be working at, looking at your resume and I want to be sure that you are giving enough detail that this person is riveted with what it is you've done. Do not talk about your aspirations. Talk about your accomplishments. Do not tell, talk about what you want. We'll get to all that later. What I want you to do now is to get to the next level in the interview. That's all we want to do. All I want to do is convince that interviewer to pass you on to the person who has hiring authority. If you dwell or even bring up, dwell on or bring up your age, you have tipped the interviewer that you are older and unhappy about it. Don't do that. Focus on what it is you've got to sell. I know sell is the ultimate four-letter word, but it really is important. That is what you are doing. Don't ever forget that all we want in the initial and subsequent interviews is a chance to meet the next level. That's all we're working for. When we finally get before the person who can make the hiring decision, here's what happens, and it shouldn't. You've told your story four or five times, and now you are bored to tears. So you decide that you are going to tell a different story. Oh, please don't do that. That will, when those four people that have already talked to you talk to the fifth person and hear what you said to number five, they're going to go, he didn't say that to me. I had no idea she'd done any of those things. Consistency is the most important thing. That is why plotters do better in job hunting than creatives. Creatives always want to add something else. Don't do it. All right, you're in the interviewing process. What are some of the obstacles? Obstacle number one is they haven't contacted you and two weeks have passed. Well, when in doubt, recontact. Aren't they going to think you're a pest? No. They will not think you're a pest. If someone says you are a pest, then you know you're probably not going to get a job with that company. Okay, we've got thousands of other prospective employers. When you recontact, say, and in the nicest way, and keep these emails short, please. Don't reiterate what you've done. You can attach a resume and say, I talked to you two weeks ago. I haven't heard. I wondered how the job hunt was going, how the search was going. Follow up and follow through. In an interview in person, it is okay to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I will send you some information as soon as I'm, you know, as soon as I leave here, when I get home. You have to create opportunities for contact. You can always say, let me send you some samples of your work, what you've done. Every contact is a selling opportunity. You don't want three months to go by. All right, so you contacted after two weeks. No one responded. It's over. No, it's not over. Haven't you ever heard about a six to nine month job hunt? They had a candidate in-house which of course they didn't tell you, they were doing a good faith search. Well, the candidate in-house got the job and three weeks later left to take a position in Tahiti for whatever reason. If you had been in regular contact, who are they going to call next? 500 people in the resume pile, are they going to start this again? Are they going to remember that you have been in regular contact? That is called follow through. It is the most important part of the job hunt and the one that my job hunters treat most cavalierly. Don't do it. If you think, and that would be 110% of all job hunters, that you are not coming across in the way you want on the interview, then practice interviewing with video. Everybody, if you don't own any video equipment, I promise you one of your younger colleagues has everything. How do you think they get all that stuff on YouTube? They have video equipment. Take the equipment, borrow it, sit in front of the camera, have a friend, you should pardon the expression, 
throw really ugly questions at you. Do answer those questions for 10 minutes. Stop. Go back and look at how you came across. By the third time, this will take you no more than 40 minutes. By the third time you've been through, and these are all different questions, by the way, but when you've seen yourself on video three times, you will be a better, stronger, more relaxed interviewee. You cannot let yourself say, oh, I'm the victim here. These people are really hostile or they really don't want to talk to me. You can't respond to any of that. You have a message that you want to give this prospective hire. It's all we're trying to do. We have to get our message across in a way that is honest, authentic, and selling. Video can help you do that. Do not tell yourself, as so many people do, everyone says I'm good in an interview. Check it out. Remember the first rule. I'll never forget my first day of journalism school. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. If someone says you're a great interviewer, look at yourself on video. Remember that persistence is 99% of the job hunt. If you believe that the people that are hiring know exactly what they want, have found all the candidates they need, and are blissfully happy with the process, you have never been a hirer. It's awful. It is awful. You are taking a chance. Now I know you, the job hunter, are taking a chance. But I, the hirer, am taking a chance. I'm gambling that after all this effort, all this work, you're going to be the perfect person in the job. How can that be? And the answer is, well, about 75% of the time it isn't. And you and I both learned from this experience, but I still am desperately anxious to get someone in that job who will do a good job and be reliable and not cause me any trouble. That's what I'm mostly interested in. One of the other obstacles that I find with job hunters is they haven't interviewed in 10 years, so they practice with someone else who gives them soft questions. No, that's why video is so much better. Write out the questions you don't want to answer. Yes, that's, you heard me. Write out the questions that you don't want to answer and have someone ask them. And have them keep asking really tough questions until you decide, hey, this is, I can handle this. I can do this. This is how you build your own self-confidence. Having people say, oh, you're really wonderful, none of that helps. Only you can feel good about you. What other people think really isn't important. What is important is how you feel about yourself. And everything you can do to feel good about yourself is important. Another thing about interviewing, please don't have three uh, double lattes or three cappuccinos before you go into the interview. Never drink anything with caffeine in it before an interview. You will come across as twitchy. And that is not what you want, and that's not what you would be without the stress. If someone says, I'd like to interview you over lunch, no alcohol, no caffeine, I don't care what you eat, I expect you are not going to eat that much anyway, but the important thing is that you not make yourself more nervous than you are already because if you're not nervous, then you're not serious about this. You have to do handwritten thank yous. Remember our contrarian strategies? You have to do them because no one else is doing them. The minute you get back from an interview, you email whoever interviewed you. And if it's a group, the chair of the group, not each individual member, and say three things. One, it was a pleasure to meet you and your colleagues today. Two, I don't know if I mentioned, and then reiterate three of your selling points. Finally, you've got to express your interest in the job and tell them how best to reach you. That's all. You don't have to go on and on. And please don't start in with, I was so impressed with all you told me about the company. First of all, that's not true because I know that you did your homework and you read all about the company before you ever got there and probably knew as much about it as the interviewer, right? 
You wouldn't go in there waiting for the interviewer to tell you anything you didn't know about the company. Handwritten thank you notes are very important because nobody does them. And as a mature job hunter, I expect you to have lots more savvy and lots more Alon than a 20-something. And one of the ways that you demonstrate that is you do a handwritten thank you. Three or four sentences. Three or four sentences in your handwriting. Now I can hear someone out there saying, but my handwriting is terrible. Okay, then get someone else to write the thank you and you dictate it. You're not off the hook. You can't just get by with an email. You have to convince me that the money that I would pay you is going to be money well spent. If you write a thank you and you're not interested, you can always say in the last paragraph or the last sentence, I think that this would not be a good fit for me with the job, but if you have jobs in and then name a different area or whatever or jobs that were more people-oriented, something. But you can't not express an interest either way. It's like you dated somebody for six years, the person thought you were getting married, and you said, well, have a nice life. What? What are you talking about? You've got to either express an interest or a complete lack of interest in the job. Now, do not plan on multiple interviews if the first time you know you wouldn't take the job. Why are you wasting your time and everybody else's? If this is not a good fit, say so. Let it go. After the initial interview, and after you've written your thank you, if you go for the second interview, you should be prepared to ask three kinds of questions. Substance questions. What is this job responsible for? What are the ways in which we measure success or failure? Culture questions. Describe the qualities other than skills and experience most important to success in this job. I can't think the number of times that people have gotten into bad jobs because they did not ask that question. What kind of answer would you expect? Well, we're looking for someone who's really aggressive. What does aggressive mean? We had a bull terrier, and if she didn't get fed at 5 o'clock, and she was, that's the target dog if you're wondering, um, she would throw her shoulder against the cabinet where the food was kept. And eventually she would have broken the cabinet if someone hadn't come and gotten the food. That's my idea of aggressive. But what I want to know is what is the employer's idea of aggressive? So, what do you say? You say, give me an example of the kinds of aggressive behavior you're looking for. This is supposed to be mutual fact finding. You're not just someone that they're drawing information out of. You're supposed to be getting information from them. And the third kinds of questions. What did my predecessor in the job do next? And if they say, well, she retired after 22 years in the same job, you won't have to ask about a career path, will you? You'll know that this is the ultimate dead-end job if that's what you want, fine. But if you think that you're going to move up from that job, you really should rethink that. Now, we had a quick question come in about handwritten thank you notes. Now, companies a lot of times work very quickly, so should you send an email and a handwritten or just stick to handwritten or what would you recommend? I would always do an email immediately after the interview. The handwritten can go out within 24 hours. I'll tell you the thing about handwritten notes. Yes, it takes them several days to get there, but when companies tell you they're moving quickly, they all move at a snail's pace. Usually someone else has to sign off on this. Someone else wants to look at the interview, at the um, resume. So don't worry about that. An immediate email to the person you interviewed with and then a handwritten note. Suppose, and this happens very often, you think after you leave that you didn't really present your best side, that you didn't give them enough information, or it wasn't the right kind of information. Hey, nothing's happened. It's okay. Write a letter. 
send an email. I would go for an email if I really thought I had not expressed it and ex not given them enough information. And what I would say is, I'm not sure I mentioned the following points in our interview, but I thought you would be interested in some of the other things I've done. Don't do this if you did tell them a great deal. We're not trying to overwhelm anybody. We're trying to make sure that in retrospect, you know that you got your selling points across. That is what is so important. So many times, we think we did it, and then afterwards you think, I didn't tell them about Project C. And that was the biggest and most successful thing I've done. OK, you still have a chance. Remember, if they interviewed you, they are at least interested. They haven't rejected you. They're probably going to interview other people. If you give them more information that's really important, it will count. They haven't made a choice at that point. OK, what kinds of horrible torture can you be subjected to? Well, most people find these two things really important. One is multiple interviews. You may spend a whole day interviewing 10 different people, and or it might even be some individuals in some group. And those people are going to get together after you have interviewed, and they're going to compare notes. Again, you must tell the same story the same way. You can't give different facts to interviewer B than you did to interviewer C. If you change your story, not only do you confuse these people, but you make them suspicious. Why wasn't I told about Project C? Why were you told about Project B instead of C? Don't do that. I know you're going to be bored. I know you're going to hate it because you're just repeating things over and over. You've got to do it. But the worst of all are group interviews. And here is why group interviews are terrible. They are, they trick you. And here's what they do. You know who is the most important person at the table. All these other people are around. And they're listening to what you have to say. And you're focused on the person you believe is going to make the buying decision. That is a fatal error. You have to give equal eye contact to everybody at that table at all times. You cannot look at the person you think is going to make the decision to the exclusion of the other people at the table. And I'll tell you why not. Because afterwards, the chair is going to turn to them and say, well, what did you think? And one of them, who got zero eye contact from you, is going to say, well, you know, I wasn't that impressed. I think we should keep looking. The person is mortally offended. People don't want to be reminded that they are less equal and that the chair is more equal. Their time was being wasted unless you worked as hard to sell each one of them as you did to sell the chair. The chair is not innocent in this case, by the way. Many times, the chair is looking for a different set of eyes to say, oh, I don't think that person's smart at all. Or, I wasn't impressed. But don't you make that happen to you because you didn't treat all of them as equally important. From my point of view, the worst, we're now going to, what, Dante's seventh level of hell. The worst interviews are in which the person who is interviewing you clearly doesn't have a clue why he or she is interviewing you or how you got there or what we're talking about. Be prepared. You're going to have some kind of a bag with you. Be prepared with a one-page summary, like a biography. So if the person said, I don't think I've seen your resume, you can say, well, here's my bio or here's the resume, and here's what's happened so far. So far. It's only humane to bring all these people up to speed that the chair, whoever's in charge, didn't do so that they can ask some questions. You are also entitled to ask questions during these meetings. How was that handled? What are your priorities? What's the timetable? Things that help you make a decent decision. One of the questions that I believe every job interviewer, uh, interviewee, 
every job hunter should ask in every interview is this. Describe a typical day. Describe a typical day because you know the things that burn you. For example, you hate meetings. You consider them a total waste of time. You're in an interview. You ask the hirer, well, describe a typical day. And the hirer said, well, usually we get here about 7, and we have bagels and coffee sent in. And we have a meeting, and then we meet until 10, and then everybody goes from 10 to 11 to check email. And then we come back at 11, and we go through a luncheon meeting. And then since we're on the West Coast, things are sort of stopped in the East, and so we have another meeting to get ready for tomorrow. If you hated meetings, that person has done you a wonderful turn to tell you that you are going to be miserable from the get-go in that company. If we also find that the second thing that burns people is what is called enforced sociability. So what that means is the boss likes for everyone in the group to go out for a drink after work on Tuesday and Thursday. You want to be at the gym at 5 o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday. How would you find out what those expectations were? You can say, is it very social? Uh, does everyone in the department get together after work occasionally? And when the boss says, oh, yes, we get together twice a week, you will know that you do not want to be there. The quality of the questions you ask will help determine whether or not you could be in that job and whether or not you could be happy in it. Now we had a quick question come in going back to thank you notes. So what if you are rejected from a position that you applied for, but one of your interviewers said to keep in touch and you know let them know if there's anything that you can do, you know, that they can do for you. How would you leverage that offer? If I believe the person was sincere and wanted to help, I would say I'm looking for contacts in a particular kind of company, probably a competitor to the company that you were rejected by. Do you know someone or do you know uh, who should I be talking to in XYZ company? I would use the person to generate contacts that I would not otherwise have access to. All right, let's talk about getting and accepting offers. Offers are to be negotiated. When you are made an offer, and it will usually be orally first and then in writing, you are not grateful. That is the opening. That is the starting point in negotiating a deal that you can accept and live with. So when somebody says, well, we think we'd like to hire you, and we're offering X dollars, is that in the range? Is that in the salary range that you had researched? If not, you can say, well, we must not be talking about exactly the same job because my salary research indicates this job would pay X to Y. And if they say, oh, no, this is an entry-level position, you know that you're going to end up walking away. Second, after you have talked and gotten an oral offer, it has to be in writing. We do not accept oral offers. And the reason we do not is there's no way of knowing that we agreed on the details. Usually you will get a written offer letter. It is common, even now in the Great Recession, to get a sign-on bonus. So if your offer does not include a sign-on bonus, you want to ask about that. You want to take at least five business days, and I would prefer 10 business days to think about the offer. What happens is you'll get, end up getting a couple of offers at the same time, but the one that you truly want is still out there in the bushes. This is the time with an offer in hand to call the company you really want to work for and say, you know, I, I would love to work for your company. I would love the job that we talked about. However, I've gotten a written offer, and I'm going to have to respond to that. Is there any chance you will be making a choice soon? And if not, or if yes, how soon? Because that's what I want to know. This is important. First of all, it puts some pressure on the company you really want to work for and on that hirer. But it also shows them that 
you're desirable to other people. One of the questions I always get is, how do I prove what I'm worth to my present company by getting an offer from another company? That's what it's all about. Does someone else out there want you? And are they willing to hire you and pay you? That's what we want to know. I have a number of people who believe that if they're offered a job and they say, we need you to start immediately, that means they shouldn't give their own company two weeks notice. Two weeks is the standard. It is not one week. It is not three weeks. If you want to give three weeks, that's fine. But most companies expect two weeks, and that means you're going to be wrapping up work there. If you can't wrap up your work in two weeks, and you've told this company when you're starting, you can tell your old employer, look, I'll be glad to come in after work and finish up or do it from home. But you do not leave them in the lurch unless you want an entirely negative reference from that boss. And when you say to the boss, I've gotten an offer I couldn't refuse, here's the state of what I'm involved in now, here's what I'm willing to do, that boss will remember. Always before you leave a job, ask for a written letter of reference. Why? It is not because we think the boss is going to forget you. It's to lock in what the person will say five years down the road. And when you have that written reference, if the boss decides two years from now that he or she's really mad about the way you behaved or whatever, you have a written letter. Some bosses won't do it. Most will because it's still not official. Your next boss, next prospective hirer still has to go through protocol to get a reference from the company you're going to work for. Um, the biggest glitch in the negotiating process is not being able to turn down the offer when you know it's not right. You know that you cannot live on the money these people are offering you know that you could not long-term work for this boss who's driven you crazy just in the interviewing process. You've got to have the courage of your convictions. You've got to say, this is not going to work. Now, you wouldn't say that to the boss. You'd say, thank you so much for the offer, but I really don't think there's a good fit. That's it. You do not go into detail. You do not say, you creeped me out during the interview. Nothing. You just say it's not a good fit. So we had uh, two quick questions come in. First, for the letter of reference from your, your current soon-to-be previous employer, would you recommend offering to write it for them, or would you just let them just ask for the letter, see what happens? And then two, if you are negotiating a salary, and the salary isn't quite what you uh, wanted or it's not meeting market expectations, but they agree to add on some things, a sign-on bonus, things like that, but they keep the salary the same. Would you be inclined to accept that or to keep negotiating for the salary increase? The first question was, would you oh, provide I would always provide my uh, boss with an outline, not the whole written letter, but an outline of what I would like him or her to emphasize. Because what I try to do with references is have each of my references show a different aspect of what I've done, attest to a different aspect of what I've done. On the second question, I would absolutely keep negotiating. You won't get an annual increase in most jobs. That hasn't been common for, well, not since probably 2008. Most people may get some kind of bonus at the end of the year, but they're not getting a percentage increase. Therefore, what you negotiate up front is probably going to be the base for several years until maybe you get a promotion or move into a different role. If they're adamant and say, we're not going to pay you market, we're going to pay you less than market, this is an extremely negative sign. And I would urge you to end it right there and say, oh, I'm sorry, but I really can't afford to move to, move to a new job for less than market. I wonder, and everybody always wonders, why employers do that. I researched that a couple of years ago, and here's what I found out. Every employer who's hiring an employee has a number in mind 
of what that employee potentially is worth to him or her. Never mind what the company's salary structure is. If I can get 10000 off this employee's salary, I can add it to someone else's because I'm just responsible overall for a budget number. That means the person is incompletely sold. And if, after two or three interviews, you still haven't convinced this person that you are worth the going right, let it go. The three most important words in the English language are cut your losses. You spend enough time on this, it isn't a go. For whatever reason, this boss does not believe that you are worth the amount of money that you need and want to do the job. Now we had one more question, sorry to, to jump back and forth. Going back to recommendations, how would you say LinkedIn recommendations fit into the letter of recommendations? Are they a replacement? Are they comparable? Should you have both? What do you think? You need to have both. LinkedIn is good, and you're, you have to have good material on LinkedIn because every HR department checks it. But for a boss that you're going to be working for directly, that person may want to contact a former boss and talk to him or her. And a letter just makes sure that if your former boss says something untoward, your new prospective boss will understand that he or she's had a memory lapse or whatever. So I think you need to cover your bases with the social media and with written letters from previous bosses. Remember that what we really want from a previous boss is that he or she will tell a consistent story because nothing is worse than a boss who tells one um, reference checker one story and another reference checker a different story. We talked about this. I want to talk about it again. 400 contacts result in 10 live job openings. That will result in five interviews, minimum. Maybe more, maybe seven interviews. Two offers. You could get more offers depending on your field, but we're going here for the irreducible minimum. Two offers allows you a solid choice. Now what can happen in my otherwise great scenario? Well. After you've been through this process, you may decide that what you thought you wanted isn't what you want now. Do not despair and decide that all this has been wasted. You have learned a tremendous amount about what people want to hire right now, this minute. You have learned a lot from the interviews in terms of the jargon, the language people use to describe ideal candidates. Two offers means you are definitely marketable. You are not going to language. The only thing that can stand in your way now is going back and deciding what it is I'm really looking for. And I have this happen all the time. This is not failure. Failure is you accept a job you don't want and you are miserable. That's failure. Success is learning about yourself so that you now reapproach, or maybe it's new hires, you reapproach some old hires, you approach some new companies with a much firmer grasp on what it is you want. Those of you who can or want to use retained search firms, remember that retained search firms get paid whether they find a candidate or not. They're going to get a third of the first year's salary plus a third of the projected bonuses. If you send your resume to a search firm, it is exactly the same thing as listing a house. Until they have someone who says, I'm looking for an X, and your resume turns up in the computer, there's nothing you can do. This is, you cannot influence the headhunter. The headhunter can only present you when your credentials exactly match what his client or her client is looking for. So you can't bug headhunters. You can't call them and say, what's up? It's a completely passive process. You get into the databases of the search firms that work in your area, and then you do all these other things we've been talking about. What if the search firm turns you up, but you've already contacted the company? Don't worry. 
do not worry about that. That is, the headhunter is going to be paid regardless. So you don't have to worry about anything like that. The other thing that you need to think about when we talk about the numbers is 400 contacts means that each one of the 400 responded to you. You're sending out 400 emails and getting no responses tells me we're not off the dime here. That's not it. It's 400 that respond. 400 people who will return your call or your email. If people are surprised to hear what it is you want and what you're doing, this is the time to take that seriously. What are you not thinking about here? What are you doing differently that isn't consistent with what you tell people, with your story? If you find an inconsistency there, I'm really good at X, but I want to do Y, then you truly are a career changer. And you're not looking for more of the same, and the headhunters aren't going to work with you. You're going to have to do it all by networking. And that is the long process that we've been talking about. What are some of the most common failures that people have? Number one, they get bored. Job hunting is the most boring thing on earth. Interviews aren't boring, but making contacts are boring. Two, they do stuff in fits and starts. This week I made 40 contacts. Now I will rest next week. And then the following week I'll make 40. You're going to be doing this. Well, uh, between now and the end of the year. If you're really job hunting and you're doing it the right way, you should be getting interviews within 60 to 90 days. And if you haven't gotten a single one, you've got to say, what am I doing wrong? You can't say, well, there's no market for my talents out there. That's not true. It's the process that is the problem. And that's the thing that I want to tell you. I think it's the most important thing I've said in all three of these sessions. There is nothing wrong with you. You aren't even that unusual. What the problem is, is you are not following the rules and doing the process that you need to do to get hired. This is a set dance. There is no way that you can improve on this selection process or shortcut it. I've been doing this for 35 years. If I had found any shortcuts, believe me, I would have shared them by now. I'm not keeping any secrets. This is a process of plotting, of prodding people to talk to you, of telling your story, and there's no way to shortcut it. You are not going to tell an abbreviated story and have 10 people say, yes, you're just what I've always wanted. It's not going to happen. So. The beginning of all wisdom is when you decide that you are going to put one foot in front of another and do this the long, complicated, but effective way. You cannot hire someone to write your resume, so don't even think about it. Your friends are better at critiquing it than a stranger would be. Your strategy has to be executed perfectly each and every time. You can't decide to blow off an interview because you're tired or bored. And the way you remain unbored is to say, this is my life. I can't be bored about this. What could be more important than finding the right job so I can be happy and effective? Noel Coward said, work should be more fun than fun. And I completely agree with him. If you don't look forward to going to work every day, that is a sentence in and of itself. So remember what your goal is. It isn't just to get a job. It is to get a job you can really enjoy and be happy with. And that's the hard part, because that means finding a fit that is going to be comfortable and where you can be most useful. Now we had one question come in about how much time do you need to spend on each one of those 400 contacts to move through the process? You're talking in terms of a couple of minutes. But remember, you're not going to reach everybody the first time you try them. People are not sitting there waiting to answer your emails. It's going to be, so today you sent out 40 emails. Tomorrow you hear back from 10. Well, that's 30 people that you're going to have to follow up with. The next time it may be a phone call. 
But what we know is it's not in manageable chunks in that way. You will spend 30 minutes trying to reach someone who's really critical in your field. You will spend one minute and someone will answer back to an email saying, oh, the person I know at XYZ Company is Joe Schmo, use my name. Okay, that's a successful contact. You will go to association meetings three months in a row, and at some point, you will meet one or two people that you'd really like to know and that are going to be useful to you. The other hundreds don't count at all because they're not really contacts. You just superficially met them. In other words, it, the interaction can be all email, takes no time at all, or you may be tracking people down for a couple of months before you can actually get some response from them. Remember, the response may be no as well. And that 400, we're counting that many of them will say, I can't help you. Don't be discouraged by that. That's not what's important. This is the number game. And it's 400 contacts or 10 live job openings. Hey, here's the benefit. Suppose you talk to 30 people and you find 10 live job openings. Are you done? Well, before you give up the contacting process, maybe you should explore some of those jobs to make sure that they're the right thing for you, that the companies are the right kinds of companies. Don't say, oh, I've got 10 live job openings, I'm done. In other words, the best advice anyone can give you is you're going to be in job hunting mode for as long as you work. Just because you got the job you wanted and it looks like it's going to work out, you can't disappear. You can't go underground. You can't decide that you'll never attend another association meeting. Remember one of the things we negotiated, we talked about this in the last session, was that the company would pay your dues to the appropriate industry association and send you to the annual meeting every year. Of course we want you to be updated. Of course we want you not to get obsolete, but we also want you to keep your contact base going. If you have 400 people in Outlook that will return your call, how many of them disappear each year? The best information I've got is at least 10%. They move out of the area, they retire, they change careers so they're not in the field you're interested in. You cannot just let that go and say, oh, well, I had 400. I guess they're all still there. And finally, after this process is over, after you're in the new job, you owe everyone of those 400 people that responded to you, or how many ever it turns out to be, a note. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much for your help. I'm now an X at the XYZ company, and I'm loving it. And what can I do for you? Because all this is based on the assumption of reciprocity. If I respond to your email, and then a month later I, my company closes, and I reach out to you, you can't pretend you don't know who I am. You've got to help me, because I helped you. The fact that you didn't get the job that I told you about is not the issue. The issue is I responded. So not only is it not fair not to tell me what the disposition was, you can say, hey, after I got full tilt into this job hunt, my boss, for whatever reason, said, hey, I think we've got a better position for you. So I didn't change. I need to know that. You can't leave me dangling, wondering what it was that became of you after you reached out to me and wanted a response from me. Suppose, after all of this, you get no offers. You've done everything right, you get no offers. What does that tell you? It doesn't tell you a thing. It tells you that you're going to need to recontact people. And you can recontact anybody that you've talked to every three months and not be considered a pest. And in fact, you should reach out selectively to contacts and say, how are you doing? What's happening? Could I be of any help to you? You've got to keep yourself on people's frontal lobe. You cannot just disappear between and then come out every 10 years or every 17 years like a cicada. 
You can't do that because we then have to, you have to spend so much more time updating me. What, is, what have you been doing? Where have you been? I haven't heard from you in five years. That's wrong. You're always going to need those contacts. So cultivate them, work with them, and most important, keep in regular touch. Just think, if you had 400 contacts and you spent 10 minutes a week, how many emails can you write in 10 minutes? Hi, how are you? What's happening? You'd probably contact 10 a week. 52 weeks a year will give you time off for good behavior. 10 contacts a week, just maintenance level, is not going to kill you. And it is so important. Because here's what I'd like to happen for you. This would be nirvana. You kept all these contacts alive, and one day someone sends you an email and says, I heard about a job, and I think it's the perfect job for you. Here's the job description. That's nirvana. That means that you have built and maintained your contacts, that they know what you do and how you do it, and they're willing to reach out and give you that kind of a lead. That is nirvana. That's what we're working for. It's not for, quote, your next job. That's not it. You're going to work a lot of years. So we need to be thinking, unless you plan to retire in 2014, you really have got to embrace this process. Because we don't know what's going to happen in the next two years to the economy. This is why we're building a structure we're not just looking for a job. That's what's important. Any other? No. Oh, we have three more questions. Oh, so we have oh three more minutes. okay, good. Here are a couple of little refinements that I'd like you to think about. If you decide halfway through the job hunt that what you've been looking for isn't going to make you happy, and you know this, I mean, you've tried this on, and you know it's not going to work, do not make an announcement. Simply change your resume, simply change your job objective, and get on with your contacts. Never announce that you are ceasing to be interested in that business field, career, and you're going to do something different because that unsettles people. Then they don't know what they think. Well, have you ever done it? Then they want to question you. This is not what we want. The three most important questions, and I want to repeat these, that you will ever ask in an interview are, Describe a typical day. When was my predecessor promoted? Third, what qualities other than skills and experience are necessary for success in this job? If you ask those, you will not end up surprised that you do not fit into the organization. Another question that I get that I think is worth addressing, do you need to have super social skills as an employee. Not unless the job requires them. Have you ever seen a tap dancing accountant? I would be worried about such a person. That is not typical. So you don't need to say, well, there are other people out there with a different skill set. We don't care. You are the person who's looking for the job, and it has to be a fit just for you. Think of this process as trying on shoes. You go into the store and you try on 50 pairs of shoes. Is it the store's fault that none of them are comfortable? Not really. Is it the manufacturer's? Well, that could be. But the point is you're going to keep trying them on until you get a pair that are comfortable. You're not going to say, oh, heck, I guess I'll just wear an uncomfortable pair. What kind of nonsense is that? You wouldn't do that. No sensible person would. It's exactly the same with the job. It's even more important that it should be comfortable. All right, well, we have come to the end of the third part of part three of the mid career planning and executing the mid-career job search. So I want to thank Marilyn Motz Kennedy so much for being here, for sharing her wisdom and her expertise with us. Just to remind you, there will be an email coming out um, tomorrow that has the links to the recording and some information about our upcoming webinars. But just to let you know, in July we have a webinar coming up 
uh, on act like you mean business. So it's about presenting and engaging with your audience, no matter who that audience is, whether it's a customer, a client, uh, upper management, or colleagues. And that's with Rob Biesenbach. And then in August, we'll have a webinar on project management with a fellow alum, uh, Dave Oshlag. And he will be here to share some of his insights on project management and how to make things go a little bit more smoothly. To find out more information about webinars at any time, you can always go to alumni and friends at uchicago.edu backslash webinars. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you next time.